What's going on guys? Trade deadline was today in the NBA and it was huge. There was a ton of trades and transactions going on. And even though they weren't all huge massive deals, it was just it was a lot more activity than I think we've seen in previous years. Um I had one video already talking all about the big trade of the day, which is the James Harden to Philadelphia for Ben Simmons, Seth Curry, Andre Drummond and two firsts. Uh, that video is up now if you haven't seen that yet. But uh, today, or with this one, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about some other trades and some teams that I think, you know, really put themselves in good positions, whether it's for the rest of this year or even just going forward. And <laughs> I guess the second biggest trade of the day um, in terms of like star power or sheer surprise or any of that is the Dallas Mavericks trading Kristaps Porzingis and a second round pick to Washington in exchange for Davis Bertans and Spencer Dinwiddie. So there have been reports all year that Dinwiddie hasn't been getting along with Washington and it's been like a clash of personalities with him and the other players. And they, they tried to deny all of that, but this kind of feels like the writing was on the wall with it and Davis Bertans continues to have uh, three years and 50 million dollars left on his contract despite not even really playing much <laughs> anymore he kind of just gets lost out there uh, so this is a huge win for the Wizards who clear two huge contracts they've already announced that Bradley Beal is going to be out for the year after doing wrist surgery and this is this is a huge win for them to clear these contracts create that cap space Try to sign Beal to a max extension in the off, in the off season, and then just go out and get get guys, get whoever they can. And on the flip side, I don't understand why why Dallas is doing this because Porzingis is or well was their best defender, and yes, he has issues staying on the court, but he absolutely changes that team's defense when he's out there. So. Giving up on him and bringing back Bertans and Dinwiddie, who knows if Dinwiddie and Luca are going to be play, be able to play together with you know either one of them <laughs> adjusting to being off ball. So really, it it comes down to do you think Davis Bertans is going to hit the open threes that Luca is going to generate for him, and is the drop off on defense going to be? you know, less than massive. Like, will they be able to to weather the storm if they lose that interior and rim protection in Porzingis? Uh, they've done okay in the games without him, but I, yeah, I just, I don't understand the logic on this one. Uh, there's a few other big moves, uh, most notably the moves that didn't happen, and that is the Lakers and the Knicks. Just Just standing pat. I don't know what was going on. There were so many rumors about both teams. And in the end, nothing happens. The Lakers are going to just roll with the lineup that they have and hope for luck on the buyout market. But unless, I don't know, Giannis Antetokounmpo or Luka Doncic want to go request a buyout, I don't know how much help the Lakers are getting from that. And then the Knicks are just building towards a catastrophe here. Um, the fans have turned completely on Julius Randle. Julius Randle has turned back the clock and is playing like it was not last year when he was All-NBA. He seems to be tired of the fans. It's just, it's a mess. And it just feels like a powder keg. And it feels like they had, they, who knows if they had a chance to move off of him or, or what happened with that. Maybe we'll find out in the coming weeks. But I just, it seems like a missed opportunity. Now, the Lakers, it was, they were always going to be in a harder spot to make any trades, but I'm surprised the Knicks didn't do anything. Not even Cam Reddish, because Tibbs seems to hate Cam Reddish. Um, we have Montrez Harrell going to the Charlotte Hornets, which I don't think is going to solve all of their issues. But again, it's another move for the Wizards, someone who wasn't um, contributing as much. Uh, it's Montrez Harrell to the Hornets in return for Ish Smith and Vernon Carey Jr., who I believe Ish Smith has played for Washington before and was very good alongside Bradley Beal. So maybe that's a good faith move or something. But for the Hornets, this is a chance to just get another rim running big who, you know, Montrez isn't like a lockdown defender, but he's, you know, he's an energetic, fast paced big man. And that's something that the Hornets desperately have needed is another center. They were a popular Miles Turner destination in fake trades. So it feels like 
like this is going to be one of those moves with like the emphasis on keeping the pace up not really so much worrying about shutting other teams down and like protecting your paint but more just being able to stay fast and with with Montrez they're definitely going to have that flexibility um the Boston Celtics made a pretty big move for them considering for the last few years it's just been all the stories about the players that they could get back or that they could have drafted or things that they could have done. Um, instead, they actually finally did something. And, you know, <clears throat> the Celtics received Derek White and the San Antonio Spurs received Josh Richardson, Romeo Langford, and a top four protected 2022 first round pick. So... That's a lot back to the Spurs, who I will get more on the Spurs in a little bit. But Derek White is the kind of player that the Celtics needed, even though he's not outright a point guard. He's a wonderful three-point shooter, um, and he will complement that backcourt if they continue running Marcus Smart at the point very well. Uh, Being able to keep uh, Grant Williams, Robert Williams, players that have been having, you know, I'm not going to say full-fledged breakout years, but they've been having good seasons. Uh, Being able to keep that, and of course your core of Smart and both the Jays, Jalen and Jason Tatum, um, is is huge. And Derek White is one of those guys that it's not a huge jump in the needle, but fans, Celtics fans should be thrilled because he's going to bring some more open shooting and some reliable shooting, if not all of the extra playmaking that they might have needed. Um, On the flip side, the Spurs, this kind of picks up and clears up a logjam that they had in their backcourt. DeJounte Murray is a full-fledged all-star this year. He is is literally on the all-star team. He will be on Team Durant in a week and a half. And him and Derek White just never were a super coalesced fit. So it makes sense for San Antonio. And to be able to bring back those assets, Josh Richardson's having a great year. Uh, Romeo Langford kind of just needs a chance just to see, you know, who he is and w- what he can do. He never really got tons of opportunity in Boston. And then just bringing back a pick <clears throat> is, you know, it's one more pick than they had after the uh, DeMar DeRozan sign-in trade. So that works out. And then the Spurs also had another move. Sorry, let me... So many notes, jeez. There it is. The Spurs also received Goran Dragic, a 2022 first round pick, and a. No, 2022 first round pick and Goran Dragic to the rap era in exchange for Thaddeus Young, Drew Eubanks, and a 2022 second round pick. So, this is a huge, huge get for San Antonio, who usually is pretty conservative around the deadlines. They prefer to to do all of their um, movement in the summer, it seems, like in the offseason. But this was a huge recoup of assets. I don't know if Dragic is going to be a buyout candidate now, but just getting the picks back after the DeMar DeRozan sign and trade um, and everything over the last couple years, they haven't had as many picks, and they're a very, very good drafting team. Josh Primo, who they took last year in the lottery, looks like he's going to be something. Um, He doesn't really get a whole lot of minutes now except for when the Spurs were dealing with those health and safety protocol issues. So it looks like they have a a strong foundation in place, and they're giving up Drew Eubanks and Thad Young, who are two players that did not really play for them anyways because of Jakob Pertl and uh, Jock Landale. Landale? Landale? I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, Those two have been basically the San Antonio center rotation, and that makes Drew Eubanks expendable. Thaddeus Young hasn't been playing. So to be able to get a second round pick or a uh, first round pick back and Goran Dragic, who was such a uh, highly sought after asset by some teams, I you got to hand it to the Spurs. I think they're they're probably one of my biggest winners of the day. And then the uh, the other big move, I guess, (laughs) is that the Boston Celtics couldn't couldn't stay stay away. They had to. They had to bring Daniel Tice back home in exchange for Dennis Schroeder, Bruno Fernando, and Ennis Cantor Freedom. 
Uh, Ennis Freedom has already been bought out by the Rockets. And Dennis Schroeder is expected to stay there for the rest of this year and then just sign with another team. Who, you know, it's interesting that the Celtics would, would punt on Schroeder after his name had come up in some trade rumors. And it seemed like he was having an okay season. But in Houston, he'll get the chance to, to be a little bit more of a veteran presence next to um, Jalen Green and Josh Christopher and those young guys. Um, it's kind of interesting that they didn't move Eric Gordon because... He was another name that was that was highly sought after, so I'm kind of surprised that that didn't happen. But at the same time, um, Boston, I guess they're clearing out space for bit for a big man by trading Fernando and Cancer. But it just kind of it feels like not what they needed. What they needed again was a bit more guard depth. But at the same time, Tice is a is a hard player or as a, a hard hustling, hardworking hustling player. Um, and he'll fit right back in, hopefully. I know he was very popular with the Celtics fans. So if anything, this at least gives them a, a presence that can be a reliable either starter or backup for Al Horford if they're going to keep playing him extended minutes. And you don't have to worry about him getting played off the court defensively or anything like that. It's just foul trouble, really. You have to worry about with him. Uh, but my other winner for this draft, uh, for this trade deadline, has to be the Washington Wizards because they took like three of their most expensive contracts: Spencer Dinwiddie, Montrez Harrell, and Davis Bertans, and they have turned it into tons of flexibility. Kristaps Porzingis does have a huge contract; he still has a couple years left on that. That is true, but he's got a lot of upside too. And he's the type of player that'll probably thrive in a healthy, next to a healthy Bradley Beal, um, if I had to guess. Just with his ability to get open, his ability to run to the rim, his floor spacing, it should be very interesting to see what that team looks like and what they continue to do. But they've they've given themselves a lot of flexibility while also taking some risks that aren't going to be like catastrophically debilitating if they go bad. Like Porzingis has two years left on his deal, so. It's not going to be the end of the world. It, it is a movable contract in the event that, you know, they decide the fit doesn't work or he's too injured or, or whatever else happens. So I think the Spurs and the Wizards absolutely had the best trade deadline with the exception of one other thing. And that is the NBA on TNT All-Star Draft Show, which was possibly the greatest 45 minutes of television that I have seen this NBA season. Um... Televising this, the All Star Game draft has been happening the last couple of years, and it's always been entertaining. You get a lot of interesting moments. Like last year, you had KD and LeBron just dunking all over the Jazz and Rudy Gobert. Year before that, you had Giannis leaving all of these other great players on the table to take Chris Middleton because Chris Middleton was his teammate. Um, just there's always something to come out of it, and and this year's draft special might have been the best because. It, it was recorded, I guess, after the the Harden trade news broke. It was, uh, and it was just, if you haven't seen it yet, it, it was incredible. Uh, it came down to the reserve draft for the bench players for both teams. There were two names left on the list. You had Rudy Gobert and James Harden and Kevin Durant on the clock. And with the straightest face he could, KD tried to say, my team needs interior defense and rim protection. Team LeBron has Giannis. And it was just, it was like one of the most cringe-inducing things. Like, it was just incredible TV. And the whole broadcast had been up until that point. You had LeBron firing off jokes about trades and and injuries and everything. You had Ch Charles Barkley asking if they had shrinks on staff at the Nets for all of the head cases. It was just everyone was in rare form and KDD for the most part looked pissed. And that just kind of kept adding to the comedy of it. Like at one point, Ernie asked him if he could give any updates on, on his injury or when he might be back. And he just straight up looked and just said no. Just like the straightest faced like, no you've ever seen and like it was like the, that deadpan style the whole time up until he finally broke with James Harden and Rudy Gobert being the last two players for him to choose from 
and it just it's it's like a minute of pure perfection so if you have not yet seen that i cannot recommend it enough the whole special and i think it'll actually be a really good competitive all-star game i think both teams you can you can see why the players that they drafted they drafted like it totally makes sense to me that kd would be like i need ja morant on my team just like it would totally make sense like that lebron would be like give me Darius Garland, give me all of these clutch sports guys, give me Chris Paul, like, and that's another thing, what a win for Cleveland, for the Cavaliers, that you have KD and LeBron arguing on the broadcast about trading Darius Garland to each other, and, like, KD was, like, visibly upset when LeBron took Darius, and it just, it was incredible, it was great TV, and those types of things sometimes don't deliver, but this, this was just unbelievable, I can't believe that they they pulled all of this off. It was just, it was the best it had been and it capped the perfect, like it was the perfect cap to the trade deadline because you had all these jokes about all the movement. You had all these jokes about Harden and Simmons and KD trying to give the diplomatic answers. And it just, it was, it was just beautiful watching all of that unfold. So if you've not seen that, I cannot recommend that enough. Um, but other than that, who were, who were some of your winners and losers from the day, from the deadline players, teams, uh, let me know in the comment section what you thought of everything. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, any of that. Um, thank you very much for watching, and I will be back soon.